Markets around the world are coming under pressure. Yields and a weak bond auction spooked investors on the back of some of the biggest software names reporting very soft earnings. Shopify was down 16% in trading today along with Uber and that really set the tone for what was a very choppy Wednesday. And with some key levels breached and broken, it's time we start asking the question, are the bears back and can they make a stand like they did in April? Today, we answer that question and dive into the consumer liquidity and what we can expect in the next three months for the S&P 500. Are things looking good? Is this the end? We've got a lot to talk about. Let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. Guys, we do a Daily Recap Show every single day. We talk about stocks and the financial markets, right? We're trying to hit 10,000 subscribers in May and we're almost there at about 9,000 subscribers, just under 9,000. So I need you guys to like this video and then hit that subscribe button. Do that for me. Let's get to 10K in May. This is the S&P 500 Daily Heat Map. Guys, a lot of red a lot of green to a completely mixed day year in the market a lot of the deep red figures had to do with stuff because of earnings you want to look at stuff like uber right and that really did uh, lead some of the other software names down but all in all a pretty average day here in software semiconductors too you know some of the bigger names nvidia caught a bit of flack then we had stuff like avgo put up a very solid day helping the overall sector and that was the story of the town you know they were red it was green except here in healthcare which seemed to take it all on the chin and financials which was pretty upbeat except for paypal down 3.2 percent here for the day very weird on no news so i think we're probably having one last final shakeout before the rally actually begins there in that stock but looking at sector analysis here for the day very very interesting to see xlu the best performing sector here up 1.05 percent in aggregate actually beating second place by almost double here with the kre up 0.54 percent in close third place was the XLF and then semiconductors technology. And they were the only three sectors that beat the SPY, rate sensitive, defensive, cyclicals. Again, just like yesterday, a huge mix of sectors. The SPY barely gained here today, up 0.01%. Same is true with the XLI. GDX was slightly down. The worst performing sector was actually ITB, the XLRE. So real estate really not liking the action here today. And that's because yields did rise ever so slightly slightly and you know real estate is just incredibly sensitive to the yield narrative xme was down 0.83 percent xlb up 0.46 percent and then software a lot of this had to do with uber's earnings Shopify's earnings, Airbnb's earnings, not a great day for software. Now, with regards to utilities, the reason why the stock is up 1% and the reason why I've actually seen quite a lot of strength in the last three days, is not necessarily the defensive trade, but if you actually have a look at S&P 500, uh, Q1 earnings right here, we have a look at utilities up 26%. And that's because last quarter's comparables are really, really easy. And this is the reason why utilities is actually seeing a lot of upbeat action in the last couple of days showing a lot of strength on a lot of breadth metrics both medium term and longer term here a lot of people can see that as a concerning factor but at the end of the day you have to remember that utility stocks are still a part of the equity market you know if they are growing their earnings if they are growing their top line their bottom line they are finding operating leverage and markets will reward that and that's exactly what we're seeing right now in utilities okay guys here we are on the chart so just diving into what happened here on the day today with the s p 500 very very interesting developments now the s p 500 pretty much flat same with the nasdaq down ever so slightly the dow jones did gain and that's because we saw the financial names xlf put up a pretty good day we saw XLI put up a pretty flat day. And then we also saw utilities as well as a couple of the other tech names inside uh, the Dow Jones just do really, really well. And that's why the Dow Jones outperformed the broader market here today. The RSP was pretty much flat. Looking at mid caps though, we did see a bit of strife in the smaller names. Mid caps took it on the chin. Same with the S&P 600 and the IWM. Value outperformed growth, but ever so slightly. And here's the big thing. You don't actually see it right here, but yields actually did rise. If we actually just hop onto the 10 year, you can see that this right here was actually today's trade. So the 10 year actually did gain ever so slightly and gain quite a bit from yesterday's 
lows. That's quite a move up here in the US 10 year. The yields exactly are like stock markets. They don't move in straight lines. We move up like that, we move down like that. There's always going to be these like relief rallies that do happen. It's just the way it works, supply and demand. All in all, in aggregate, we did actually see bonds uh, lose on the day ever so slightly, particularly long-term bonds as well as the AGG. In fact, that looks like it probably wiped out all of yesterday's gains. As it did, we did close here above yesterday's high in the 10 year. Now looking at Bitcoin, let's have a look at this chart because yeah, continuing to come under pressure, we can actually see that, you know, use this massive trend line as resistance multiple times, did the same right here. And now we're actually into this daily downtrend and it's looking like this is going to be a lower high unless we find support. If this continues to move down and we break this level right here, um, that is not going to be constructive. And that opens up the 52,000 level here for Bitcoin. Looking at stuff like gold, what did gold do on the day? It came down virtually nothing. Silver was actually up ever so slightly. And then the dollar did gain. Actually, this is probably, this is the fourth day of gains here for the dollar. If we include, I mean, the rally off the lows right here. Very, very weird. Still down for May. This is where May opened actually, but quite the rally here in the dollar. We pretty much went from the 104 level to the 105 level. That's a pretty big move in the dollar. And then crude up 1%. Actually, I actually did say yesterday that we're probably going to find a bit of a tradable bounce right here, you know, move up against supply and demand and dynamics. That's exactly what we're seeing. Where do we go? We could probably find resistance here at the 81, 82 level, maybe just below you know, trade here and then continue moving down in crude, maybe to the 76 level. Maybe I reckon the bottom of the range will probably be the low right here. And then we can make another sustained move to the upside towards the end of May into June. But let's actually talk about the S&P 500 really, really quickly here, guys. So, you know, we've said this for the last couple of days and pretty much since the start of the weekend video, I said 5,200, the call gamma resistance is going to be a very, very very strong area of support. And we actually did see that, you know, we rejected here, put in a shooting star doji, and we did actually pull back, especially in early hours trade. We did actually gap down, but then part a lot of the day's losses after that gap down. Now, we're looking at the five minute chart, very, very interesting trade. We saw a lot of early strength in the markets after this gap down. So bulls really did like this one, this 5165 area right here. And then we made our way to above the day's open. We were actually positive at one point in the S&P 500 right here for the day. Then bears did come in, take us all the way back. We put in a higher low and then we made our way all the way back, forming an equal high, kind of a lower equal high, inconsequential, and then pretty much closing out at yesterday's close, pretty much flat for the day here in the S&P 500, but quite an eventful day of trade. If you do look at it, you do zoom out. It's still quite a compressed range of volatility. And this is exactly what happens in positive gamma. You buy dips, sell rips you buy dips, sell rips with an overall bullish tilt. And that is exactly what we saw today. Yes, we did gap down. Yes, we did finish flat. But you look at the trade from this candle to there, that is bullish. And you just buy dips, sell rips all the way to the close. It's a very, very effective trading strategy. If you're a day trader and you're not looking at gamma levels, I do suggest you look at it because it does sort of give you the direction that you do want to follow uh, for the day. Now, what do I see for the rest of the week? Well, I think we're probably going to see continued downside here, especially with a couple of the earnings reports that did show up. Probably just going to have a bit of a pullback here in the S&P 500. That's probably going to be led by software. And if yields do continue to tick up into the end of the week, we're also going to see some rate sensitive names and maybe even some cyclical names like industrials, like financials come a little bit under pressure, but we should find support anywhere in this 5100 area. You know, I've said that all week. And then we're looking for a bounce back and a move higher into next week into OPEX as we do rally into that OPEX period. And as we do see yields continue to move down, I do think that yields have top for the year. That is my opinion. And everything we're seeing right now is very, very short term. But for now, look to 5100 anywhere, you know, in this 5150, 5100 area, look for a tradable bounce. Not looking too good here in the after hours uh, in the SPY down ever so slightly. But if we do pull further back into the zone, that's completely normal. But if we actually do a rally, uh, you know, do expect resistance to come at 5200. It's going to be very hard to break this 5200 area without the core gamma resistance moving up the tape. So I do think that we're probably at the interim high here. We might go to like 50, 5225. We might go to this high pullback right there. That can happen, especially if we like just gap up over this level. Do expect like a, a bit of resistance to enter this level, especially leading up into the OPEX next week. And only until a lot of this gamma 
rolls off the tape, that's when we can really break through these levels, move higher, and then look to all-time highs in the S&P 500 beyond OPEX week after next. Now, guys, before we get into earnings, I just want to show you a very quick statistic that I showed you guys towards the end of April here at the start of May, and I just want to quickly roll back to it because when we do get stats like these, they tend to be high probability setups, and we are starting to see that here in the month of May. Now, this is the S&P 500 after the first negative month following a turn of the year hat trick. The TOY hat trick is defined as when December, January, and February was all positive, and then when we get the first negative month. Now, that could be in April, July, it could be in March, it could be as late as August, but these are the returns after the first negative month, one month later, three months later, six months later, and then the max drawdown in each scenario. And the reason why we looked at the stat is because April was the first negative month after the turn of the year hat trick. We could see here that one month later, 21 wins, four losses, the 21 and four, average return, 2.54%. Three months later, 20 and five, 4.1% return, 3.18% median, and then six months later, 22 and 3, 8.5% average return, 6.84% median. So essentially, when we do get a negative month after a positive turn of the year hat trick, we don't want to get ever more bearish. In fact, we do want to get bullish and we do want to buy those dips in that month because one month, three month, and six month returns are often very, very positive. And you also have a look at the max drawdown. Yes, there are a couple of double digit drawdowns here, but do take the that with consideration that there's a ton that have zero. In other words, from month one, day one, we're pretty much rallying off the month's lows and we never saw a drawdown in that month. Look how many zeros there are. There are a ton of them. And there's a lot of drawdowns that are just like 1%, 1.24%, 2.4%. And yeah, there are double digit drawdowns, but you have to look at it in aggregate. Very, very positive statistics, highly favorable stats here for the bull. Let's talk about earnings. So we have another big day of earnings. We had Shopify, Uber, and Affirm will report before the bell. After the bell, we had Wish, AMC, Robinhood, Beyond Me, the trade desk, Airbnb. And today we're going to look at two of the big ones, Shopify and Uber. Okay, looking at Uber's earnings, guys, bit of a bit of a disaster here. Uh, missed heavily on EPS, negative EPS here for the quarter, negative earnings. Market was expecting uh, 0.22, so a big, big miss here on the EPS side. Market did not like that, but they did beat on sales. So we need to, there's something happening in the cost situation there for Uber. Maybe it's some of these wage, minimum wage hikes that we're seeing in like California on the West Coast that could be impacting this and just around the world. We do know that Uber's dealing with a, a lot of like strikes from taxi drivers and maybe some legal issues. That could be the reason. So sales looking good, earnings not looking that great. And we also saw they missed here on gross bookings. They missed here on monthly active users and guidance, gross booking guidance, 39.5 billion. Market was expecting 40 billion. So you know, you miss on EPS right here, barely make revenue, and then you miss on uh, guidance as well. The market's going to sell you off. The stock was down 6% in the pre-market at one point. I think at one point it was down nearly 9%. But other than that, overall, looking at the, the numbers itself, very, very average. I need to dive a bit deeper into it, but looking at Uber's fair value, guys, so they did print $4.2 billion of free cash flow. If we use a 25% growth rate, by the way, the street's expecting about 42%. This right here is very conservative with an 11% discount rate, 2% perpetual rate. We're looking at a fair value of Uber here of 78.78, 16% under its fair value. Its current price, at least in the pre-market, all of these segments were recorded in the pre-market, the earnings segment, $65.52. So yeah, 16% under fair value. That's the cash it used on hand. That's its total debt. That's the shares outstanding as per the latest quarterly. So it is undervalued, but Uber did get a little bit more expensive uh, just based on the guidance and its future outlook. Now, looking at Shopify, down 16% here in the pre-market, even though they did beat on sales, they did beat on EPS, and they did beat on Q2 revenue growth. What the market did not like was this right here. It says gross margin for Q2 expected to decrease by about 50 basis points versus Q1 2024. And the market did not like this right here. I also think that a high teens growth rate in the high teens percentage that came just in line. And I do think some firms actually saw revenue growth for Shopify a little bit higher. So it probably missed on some books. It probably missed on some some of the firms at Wall Street, but I, the data I look at, this was actually right in line with what the street was expecting. But they were down 16% here in the pre-market. They did not like their earnings. When you see gross margins decrease, the street does not like that. That's the one thing you don't want to do with earnings, guys. You, you want to hit your EPS, you want to hit your revenue, and you want to either expand or keep your gross margins as is. Otherwise, you get this type of price action, especially when you're a firm like Shopify that's absolutely priced to perfection. Now, let's look at a fair value here. So, you know, this company did one 
$1.51 billion in trailing three-month free cash flows. This is all based on the recent quarterly, guys. 2% terminal, 11% discount. You know what I usually do. 35% growth rate. By the way, the street's expecting 98% here for earnings over the next five years. That's compounded annually. So 35% growth rate, quite conservative. And you can see a $5.8 billion in cash, a billion dollars in debt, $1.29 billion shares outstanding. Fair value is $50. The stock is trading at a 26% premium to its actual price. So, you know, if this does dip into the 50 range, I think it's time to start accumulating. Also, I did look at the overall earnings and then wasn't anything structurally bad with Shopify's earnings. I think the reason why they're having margins uh, contracting is simply because of their freight business. They have a freight business that they're selling and that's affecting EPS and adjusted EPS. And I think the street also had a bit of an overreaction to those adjusted numbers and we might see the street come to terms in the next couple of days. So, you know, I think, you know, down 16%, we might actually see a bit of a tradable bounce in the next couple of weeks. But, you know, fair value here for me is $50. I mean, this is a lot of margin of safety is built into this price. You can actually increase the growth rate quite significantly, to be honest. And you should actually get much higher fair value. You could also put the discount rate at like 10. It's only got a billion dollars of debt, not a handful of debt relative to the cash on hand and relative to just overall revenue. And yeah, 2% term rate is pretty standard across the industry. So yeah, lackluster earnings. Look, Shopify's earnings weren't bad. Again, the underlying earnings weren't bad. It just has to do with guidance. That was the real issue and just some accounting measures with the sale of their freight business. All right, guys, let's talk about the earnings recap. We're probably going to stop doing these over the next couple of days because earnings is winding up. You can actually see right here, 424 out of the 500 companies have reported. So we pretty much got all of the data we need to. We just have stuff like NVIDIA, Costco, a couple of the software names later this week uh, to bake into these earnings. But where we are right now, there's not going to be much deviation unless NVIDIA comes with a huge beat or a huge miss because it does account for quite a bit of earnings, at least here in 2020. But things are looking really, really good. S&P 500 blended earnings is sitting at 7.8% right here, excluding energy 10.9%. With this weird BMY adjustment, which is just a $12 billion one-time charge related to the acquisition of Karuna Therapeutics, we're also sitting at 10.9%. So we just exclude this charge and include energy. We're sitting at 10.9 double-digit earnings growth here on a percentage basis. And at the start of earnings season, the expectation was 3.5%. So huge beats on the earnings side as well as revenue 3.9% here on the revenue front 3.5% expected at the start of earnings season 4.2% here excluding energy and this right here is part of the reason why we've had quite a run-up in the last three to six months the fact is earnings are really really good and this is just some data here from Carson Research guys they say that returns are mostly driven by earnings over the long period so they have five years 2020 to 2024 at least up until the 3rd of May and you can see right here earnings growth multiple multiple growth, dividends, and then the total return. So since 2020, and do take into consideration, we actually had a bear market in this period. The S&P 500 has returned 70% in this four and a half, five year period. 50% of it was driven by earnings. 12% of it was actually driven by multiple growth. And then 9% of it was driven by dividends. I wish that we put buybacks in here, but I guess that's actually baked into the total price return driver as well as earnings growth. And you can actually see that we do go through cyclical periods where we have multiple growth as the major driver of returns and then earnings growth. So we see multiples expand and then earnings to compress those multiples. And now we're in 2024. Earnings are expected to accelerate. They are coming in really, really good. And that's why the index is holding its gains. And you can see that in totality, the majority of returns since 2020 has been from earnings. So disregard anything that's saying this is a multiple expansion rally. That simply isn't the case. Now, looking at the rest of the world and not just the S&P 500. Now, it's really hard to actually get the data from all of these countries, but I've gone ahead and found some here from LSEC. So essentially, this is just the first financial year growth. So FY1, so financial year one is 2024. And then financial year two is 2025, right? So we could see that Canada expected to return double digit growth here in financial year one and two. Very, very interesting. That puts the PE valuation at 15.4. 13.3 and the revision trend looking very, very healthy. Now, I'm not going to go through every single data point right here, but I do want to go through a couple that might be of interest. The first one is Germany. Look at the German growth, 9.2% this year, 14% next year, trading at an 11.9 forward 2025 PE. Look at Japan, double digit growth for both years, 17%, 10%, trading at a nearly a 15x PE 2025 and still a reasonable 2024 PE. The United Kingdom is expected 
expected to accelerate. This is literally an emerging market multiple at 11 times earnings. Let's look at Australia, 8% growth year in 2024, 10% expected next year, trading at 18 times, 16 times. So very, very pricey, especially with the fact that where earnings are expected to decrease by 8%. Look at China, 29% earnings growth this year, expected 17% next year. The recovery is well underway. Look at these multiples. This right here, if you can stomach the China risk, the CCP risk, you're looking at a very, very good uh, index that you'll be buying growth at not a reasonable price, growth at a value price. But the earnings revision trend does look uh, not that great. So probably if anything, these are going to move lower and they are going to move higher. Whereas you look at something like the United States, 1.15, 1.05. So the, rev the revision's momentum is to the upside. But you guys can go ahead, have a look at all of this very interesting data points right here. And it does look like globally, earnings are expected to accelerate. I mean, apart from like Australia, Belgium here in 2024, they're the only countries where earnings are expected to decline. Every other country is expecting earnings growth here in 2024 and 2025. Now, looking at the US more specifically, looking at mid cap growth, small cap growth, SP 600, SP 400, and then the Russell 2000 guys, very interesting data. We don't always get this data. So when we do, we have to look at it and we can see here in the first quarter 2024, earnings growth for the mid cap index is actually negative 5.58%. The second quarter we're looking flat and the second quarter here is when we're looking to inflect major earnings growth to the upside for mid cap. So now's the time to get into mid caps if you haven't already because we have earnings uh, down, down here flat and then we inflect here with 8% growth, 12% growth, 1.6% growth for the full year 2024 and then we have 16, 19, 17, 16% growth in 2025 for a full calendar year expectation of 16.08% growth. And that would put the S&P 400 trading at a 13 times multiple on CY25 earnings. Very interesting. And on CY24, 15.9. That's just calendar year, by the way. Small caps, very similar situation. The inflection point here is in the second quarter, 2024. And then it's double digit growth all the way until the fourth quarter, 2025. And right now on 2024 earnings, the S&P 600 is trading at 15 times and 12.6 times on 1,025 earnings. And then the Russell 2000. This is where it gets a bit spicy. And this is why I kind of recommend getting into small cap quality, the S&P 600 versus the Russell 2000, because earnings are a bit of a shit show, but they are expected to improve in a big way. But this index is trading at quite the high forward multiple. Now let's dive into it. Negative 12.35% so far. And by the way, the Q1 2024 earnings are blended earnings. So the companies that have reported and they're expected to report, this is what's here. And then the rest of them is just forward expectations. The second quarter, is expected to be 1.34% earnings growth. And then we are expected to see huge growth here in the Russell 2000, 21% growth, 49%, 19%, 66%, 50%, 36%, 35%. And I think what the market is waiting for is some of these quarters to materialize. They want to see if these earnings are just euphoric expectations from analysts or if they will actually materialize. And if they do, we are going to see the Russell rally like you've never seen, especially if we are to achieve you know, 49%, 19%, 66% earnings growth in a single quarter year over year. But right now, as it stands, the Russell 2000 trades at a 25.4 PE and on CY 2025 earnings 19 times. So the market is in a wait and see mode here for the Russell 2000. Guys, if you are looking to buy an index that's not the S&P 500, I would probably look here at mid caps. It's trading at roughly the same multiple as the S&P 600, but you just get higher quality, bigger companies in the mid cap index. Now looking at buybacks really, really quick. This is corporate buybacks are now above seasonal levels at this time for the ninth consecutive weeks. Buybacks by Buffer Corporation clients as a percentage of S&P 500 market cap by the week of the year. You can actually see we're above the seasonal trend level. We have been for quite a number of weeks here. And this gray period right here is earning season. It often coincides with a blackout period. Period. So you can actually see right here that after this week, very few earnings in the S&P 500 will be taking place. And you know, it's back to buybacks, back to regularly scheduled programming. And I do think we're going to see further upside here in the market, especially with uh, buybacks trending above seasonal levels. So let's talk a bit about the economy. Guys, this right here is the LEI. It's the leading Ecomdex or leading economic indicator. And essentially, it's just a fantastic little indicator that determines where the economy is standing, great economic health. And generally speaking, above the zero line right here, the economy is in good standing below and conditions 
conditions are deteriorating. Now, it's a great indicator in determining when a recession is going to start, especially when we get below this negative five level here called deep contraction territory. You can see here in the year 2000 recession when we pulled into deep contraction territory. Very similar situation here in 2008, the GFC, and a similar situation here in 2020 recession ensued in all three cases. However, right here, we're in deep contraction territory. We've been in it for quite a while, at least 18 months, and there is still been no recession. And that's because of the way the LEI is constructed. And it really shows the limitations of this indicator with regards to the current economic regime we're in. You see, this indicator places a lot of weight on manufacturing, inventories, as well as the yield curve, but doesn't place a lot of weight on what's happening on the fiscal side with regards to government spending. And that's why we're in this situation right here, where we're in deep contraction territory, but the economy is still in pretty good health. In fact, a far superior LEI measure is actually the Carson Proprietary Leading Economic Index. This is Carson's research version of their LEI. So they take the original LEI and place an equal weight on each of the components. They don't weight it, they don't weight it according to its average or relevance. And this is where we are right now. We're actually above the zero line. The dip we saw here in 2022 wasn't that substantial. We saw a rebound. And I think this is a far superior measure to use compared to the previous LEI. And we'll see how this plays out. But this is part of the reason why I was bullish for most of last year, I was looking at the Carson Research LEI indicator and said, I just don't see it coming because I do think that this indicator is a far superior measure to the other LEI. And supporting the economic growth thesis, this right here is real final sales to domestic purchases. And all this is, is just a sum of personal consumption expenditures, gross private fixed investment, government consumption expenditures, and gross investment. And this right here is sort of like a derivative of GDP, and it's sitting at 2.8%. Very, very strong right here. The 2010 to 2019 average was 2.4%. This was a fantastic time right here to be in the markets. Huge economic growth in this period right here. And we're actually seeing above trend growth at 2.8%. At the same time, we got red book data sitting at 6%. This is some of the highest percentages we've ever seen in a very, very long while. And it just shows the increase here in consumer consumption as well as retail. So a lot of people say the consumer is tapped out. Well, according to the data we're seeing, that is simply not the case. It's telling us a very, very different story. At the same time, we aren't really seeing any huge jumps in layoffs. Now, excluding this massive anomaly right here, actually seeing layoffs actually continue to trend lower here in 2024. This is actually what you want to see in a very healthy and strong job market. And, you know, there's a lot of headlines out there talking about layoffs and they do make the headlines, but the data tells a different story. And layoffs, there's just no jumps in them. Layoffs are still historically low. And in a strong economy, you see very low layoffs. So looking at gamma, guys, positive gamma continues to build quite heavily, especially this 5300 strike here. The call gamma resistance is still 5200. So we're still seeing a lot of gamma being built out here. Negative gamma is actually falling off the tape ever so slightly, particularly above the 5000 strike. We're seeing a lot of this move just off the tape, maybe even move up the tape. 5135 is the gamma flip. So it moved ever so slightly up the tape. And this negative, this positive gamma that was here at the 5,000 level is fading a bit. Really interesting that the 5,300 strike is getting built out and the 5,200 strike. So it does look like we are still in this 5,200 range. So do look for, you know, some major resistance here at this level. However, if we do break above, it can actually act as very strong support as well. But I do favor more of a resistance play at the 5,200 level into the end of the week here. That being said, you'd be, you do want to be buyers of dips in a market environment that is positive. You want to buy dips, sell rips, lean bullish, lean long, and just look to all-time highs, 5,200. And after May OPEX, we're going to look at 5,300 for the S&P 500. All right, guys, let's break into some charts. Guys, this is the 770 thrust. We have some very interesting charts here this week. And this right here is a breadth thrust indicator, very, very similar to the ZBT thrust. And the 770 thrust indicator is triggered when the percentage of rising stocks in the market exceeds 70% for three consecutive days. When that happens, this is triggered. And these are the returns we can expect. Now, I know this chart is very small. If you go on my Twitter, you can actually get the fully HD version, but I'm going to read it out for you guys. And it's very, very simple. Five days later, 10 days later, 21 days, 63, 126, 152. So essentially one year, six months, three months, one month, 10 days, five days, the returns we can expect. And you can actually get very, very linear returns. And pretty much we get these type of thrusts after the market has pulled back and then we rally to the upside. And it's pretty much a great indicator 
data that tells us that the upward momentum from the pullback can be trusted. Now we do want to look at, you know, sort of 21 days and above because we're not really day traders on this channel. We're more swing traders slash long-term investors. Now we can see at 21 days out, median return 2.8%. Now that's just one month later, right? Three months later, 5.9%. Percentage of the time positive here is 69.6, but then it goes into the 80s three months later. So essentially what this data right here is telling us is that we can actually experience quite a bit of volatility, at least on the hit rate in terms of positive versus negative up to the first month. But after the first month, the risk is asymmetrically skewed to the upside. And we can see that here too. Six months later, 11.4% return. One year later, 19.4% when the triple 70 thrust is triggered. 95.6 hit rate. So 95% of all years were positive. And this is the crazy part. The biggest loss ever taken when this thrust was triggered was 9.5% one year later. And that was in March 2007. The biggest gain was 51.1%. Absolutely insane. So this right here is a fantastic indicator. It tells us that there is probably more up side left, especially in the long to medium term three months onward. Now looking at other seasonal charts, this is the S&P 500 three month seasonality for the presidential election year. So in the fourth year of the presidential cycle, three month return period. So we got like Jan to March, Feb to April, March to May, etc. This is where we are right now. And this is what we're going into. So you can see that we're in the second quarter, going into the third quarter, going into the fourth quarter. What are the returns we can expect? Now, actually the sell in May trope doesn't really work for the three month period period here in the presidential election year cycle. In fact, May to July is actually one of the most positive periods in the presidential cycle, returning 2.03%, 62.5% of the time it is higher. Very interesting stats. We then actually move from June into August, the most positive three month period in the presidential election year, returning on average 7.27%. Then we have July to September, 5.21% return. And again, 75% hit right here. June to August, 62.5% hit rate from July to September. We do get a bit of volatility here in August to October, September to November, and then we get outsized returns from October to December, November to January, and then December to February tends to be quite lackluster, but positive nonetheless. Now, with regards to the volatility we see here in August and October, it is actually still positive months, don't get me wrong. It's just that the hit rate is not quite that high, relatively speaking to a month like this. But this is only a presidential election year. If we actually go to the three month seasonality of all years, going back to 1928, we can actually see very linear returns over a three month period. And this is why it always pays to be invested. It always pays to be bullish. You could see Jan to March, Feb to April, March to May, April to June, May to July, June to October, and July to September, all return upward of 1%, as you can see right here, in some cases, 2% and June to August, a 3% return, 64.6% of the time higher. Very positive stats when you look at this, the best three month period in the year. We then do get a bit of volatility from August to October. So this is really when you wanna sell. And it's roughly the same time we experienced volatility in the market last year. We actually bottomed on the 27th of October. We normally return negative 0.14%. 54% of the time is a positive period. And then we actually get amazing returns towards the end of the year, September to November, October to December, November to Jan, December to February, completely outsized returns. And actually the best month of the year is November to January. This Christmas end of year, some would call it the Santa Claus period, 3.54% return, 66% of the time positive. Very, very interesting stats. And it does look like the longer and it does look like when it comes to equities and when it comes to the S&P 500, it pays to be invested and it just pays to sit through the volatility because you normally get quite outsized returns, relatively speaking. So guys, something we've been tracking for a couple of days is global liquidity conditions because we said about a week ago now that liquidity had actually bottomed here for both the United States and the Eurozone. And that once we get out of this turbo puke, puke zone back into the bid zone, we would really start to see indices move higher and it would actually be a tailwind to get us to new all-time highs. And that is exactly what we're seeing. We saw United States liquidity conditions get above the bid in today's trade. We're still to get there in the Eurozone. However, we have seen significant upward momentum here in liquidity. And this is really just a tailwind for the market. And hopefully we can continue to see liquidity move up or at least balance in the zone right here and not really, you know, absolutely puke 
sort of just balance between this bid zone and that would be healthy market dynamics supply and demand coming into play without any major stuff that can freak the market out like massive gaps up or massive gaps down but if you've made it up until here thank you so much for watching if you like this video please subscribe hit that notification bell like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm cheers